Mm-hmm. What makes a ketchup a ketchup? Ketchup is like a fruit that's cooked down in vinegar and sugar to preserve it over the winter. So okay. ketchup is like a really old traditional ketchups. And it's really just like you take fruit or um, even like mushrooms and you just cook it down in a vinegar, sugar, spiced mm. thing. And it's a condiment that's supposed to, you know, like last for over winter, basically. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to The Beat Podcast. I have a fantastic guest. We have a fantastic guest here today, Becky Jones of Acre Homestead on YouTube, who I want to say, Becky, I found your channel six or seven months ago. And to me, it felt like it it came out of nowhere, sort of. Um, one day, there was nothing. And then the next day, there was <laughs> Acre Homestead. And I was very captivated by the style of the videos, and it seems like a lot of other people are as well. So I'm, I'm really excited to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. So we, we were talking just before we started recording, and you, you really didn't start doing this until, what, maybe two, two and a half years ago or so? Yeah, in January, it will be three years I started my channel. Yeah, happy happy third anniversary. That's, Thank that's you. a crazy amount of growth in that period of time. And, and before this, you were a dental hygienist, right? Yep. The obvious question, I guess, is how does a dental hygienist get into, you know, homesteading, making a YouTube channel, and then like building this this community, I think, of people who are really following along with your journey? Well, I was a consumer of a lot of YouTube. I loved watching all the homesteading channels. And I, when my husband and I first got married, we lived just in a small suburban lot in town. And I don't know how I started watching all these <laughs> YouTube channels where people were growing their own food. And I was already into cooking. I already loved to to cook. And so it just seemed like the natural next step to try to, you know, if I wanted to make homemade pasta, to then grow the tomatoes to make the pasta sauce. And so we moved to our last homestead and I was a dental hygienist. And then 2020 happened and all the craziness that went along with that and being in the healthcare field. And I thought I didn't document my first year gardening when we first started. And so I kind of regretted that. I didn't have any record of it other than just some photos. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, I think I'm going to try this YouTube thing. I've seen enough people do it and I would love to be able to look back and see what I did. And so when I was starting my seeds in January indoors, I thought, I think I'm going to record it. So that was my first time recording and I just committed to doing it. And I haven't looked back. Here we are. Yeah. How yeah, did you? So when you first hit upload on that first video, because for me, that was a very long time ago. I think my first video went up 10 years ago or something like oh, that. Wow. Um, but and, and it was kind of like kind of like your story. I guess I just wanted to document what I was doing and kind of like learn by teaching, I guess, like tr- like yeah. synthesizing the information back then it was hydroponics. So like synthesizing it was helpful for me. Um, but when you first hit upload back then, how did the snowballs start to roll? Like, where did you find the people that are now in your community? I think I kind of filled a void on YouTube in the gardening and homesteading niche yeah. um, because I do so much cooking. Uh, there's a ton of cooking content on YouTube and there's a ton of gardening and homesteading content, but I tried to like bridge that gap, I think. And I think that's kind of what helped build this community as quickly as it did is it brought the food from the garden into the kitchen and now what to do with it. And then I was able to do cooking all year long. And, you know, that's why I guess where the whole doing like big Thanksgiving dinners and parties and stuff kind of came into play with the whole broader audience. Cause I think everyone can relate to eating food. You know, we all eat (laughs) generally three times a day. And so then just, I think that encourage the people that like to cook to then maybe try to grow food. And then the people that liked to grow food kind of like, okay, now yeah. what do I do with it? Yeah. A nice crossover, I guess. It, it, it is the the eternal question that in the early days when I was doing it, it was really just about the growing. I was so interested in just how plants grew and, you know, harvest is a bonus almost. And and now with our Epic Homesteading channel, we are getting more into the cooking style of things. But uh, you know, I cook for max two people most of the time. So I'm not making some of these these freezer meals that I, I see show up on your channel. But I kind of want to go back. You mentioned that you didn't document the first year of your journey, but you did decide to buy a one acre plot of land. And I think uh, somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, right? 
Yeah, we're in Southwest Washington, just kind of like the Portland, Oregon metro area, okay. but we're in Washington State. Got it. And so, yeah. what was the impetus for that? Because prior to that, you you loved to cook. You were living in a suburban lot, so why make that shift? Well, when we were living in our suburban lot, I was buying a lot of food from local farmers, and I had read um, Animal Vegetable Miracle and um, The Dirty Life by Barbara Kilsolver, and they both talk about like CSAs and buying local, even if you live in a suburban lot. And so that's kind of what I was doing. And then I wanted to try to grow my own food. And so that's when we moved from our little tiny lot to our one acre lot so that I could try to grow some food. And there was already like a house on the property and all that sort of stuff yeah. set up, right? Yep. It was a pretty cool house, actually. It was right in town and it was just an old home that had a big lot. And so mm -hmm. it wasn't, I could have chickens too because of just the random zoning and everything like that. And there was no like limitations on roosters or how many chickens you wanted oh, just nice. because of the random, you know, like how it fell. But um, it was nice because it was a good step into, you know, buying a bigger piece of property and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so that, that property you're no longer growing on then. No, we sold okay. that last year. Yep. And we moved to where we are now a year ago. And how big is that lot? Um, we are around 10 acres, but most of it's wooded and yeah, yeah. Um, it's actually kind of nice because then we don't have to maintain most of it. Did you buy it with like the idea of, I know some people will buy like a, a wooded lot and they'll maybe use some of the timber or they'll like run pigs through the forest and, and that sort of thing. Is that interesting to you or? We could log it, but I think we'll probably just keep it the way it is because it kind of is a nice privacy border. We've got a nice, you know, kind of meadow area and then we've got nice foresty area. And I think we're just going to leave it the way it is. Um, we don't have any plans to do anything more than just chickens and a garden. Mm -hmm. I buy my pork from a local farmer. I buy my beef from a local farmer and I think we are at about max where we are now and I don't mind supporting someone who can do it really well and has all the infrastructure and that's kind of, we just like growing the vegetables and having the yeah. chickens. Yeah. It feels like unless you really have like a penchant for exploring every different type of uh, food production, specialization is is obviously the way to go, right? Like yeah. I, I might want to have some pigs or I guess some some cattle, but I would fully also recognize that economically, I'm probably not raising the cheapest pounds of beef in the, in the world. Yeah. If I was doing it on my own land, right? Yeah. I, the, the pork and the beef I buy, they're from farms that are 30 minutes away. And, you know, they have the whole infrastructure. They've got it down to, you know, they're pasture raised, they're grass fed. And it would just be me trying to learn yeah. another pretty big skill to that I'll just let them focus on what they're really good at. Yeah, yeah, no, makes sense. So, okay, so let's go. Let's go back again to when you were at the suburban lot. And you, you mentioned you were still buying locally quite a bit. And I think a lot of people mm -hmm. listening are in that situation right now. They're not in the one acre one or even the ten acre situation. And so, if someone wants to get started with that, like what what was your playbook back then? Because I'm assuming you weren't really growing much of anything yourself at the time. Yeah, when I was on my small suburban lot, we. We bought that house because there was a ton of trees around it. And so it was private and we were in a neighborhood, but we had nobody behind us because there was a big wall of trees and that was awesome for privacy. But there was probably about two hours of sun that I got in that backyard. So I could grow herbs and lettuce and I did a couple containers on my front porch of potatoes and carrots, but that's really all I could do. And so um, I was a part of a CSA, which is Community Support Agriculture. I... In my area, there's a ton of farms and there are ones that do spring and summer and there's fall and winter ones. And so I basically could at least once a week in the spring and summer and it was every other week in the fall and winter, I would go pick up a share of produce. So I, I paid the farmer a price at the beginning of the season and that helps kind of fund them to buy their seeds and their fertilizer and get their farm ready. And then every pickup day, you go pick up a share of produce. And that's kind of a really cool way to get into if you want to become a gardener because it teaches you how to cook with what you have, not with what you necessarily want. Because when you're gardening, like right now I have probably 100 pounds of tomatoes sitting on my yeah, counter <laughs> and, um, you know, we are eating fresh tomatoes every day. And so I'm not going and trying to buy something at the grocery store out of season because I want to use what I have on my 
you know, countertop right now. And so becoming a part of a CSA or a farm kind of helps teach you to like eat in season and eat with, it's a shift mind shift kind of, of making a menu plan, going grocery shopping and buying those groceries. It's okay. I've got this. So let's make a menu plan from what I have. And then I would buy, I buy my beef and my pork from the same farm today that I did when I was in my small acre lot. And even on this big property that we have now, I don't grow everything. I just Mm -hmm. bought 150 ears of corn from a local farm because (laughs) I have a corn in my garden, but it's not enough for me to put up for an entire year. And so even, you know, people that have these big gardens, you know, you might have a crop failure. And so it's good to have the skill of learning how to source something in case something fails or you just didn't grow it that year. Yeah. I mean, I think that's something I've experienced now because I've been in my a third of an acre lot for almost three years now, actually very close to three years on September 1st, it'll be three. But um, yeah, so I've had three seasons. The first one, obviously a little bit slower than than the prior two, but it, it's been interesting to see the fluctuations and performance of crops across those three seasons. And so, you know, last year was a fantastic corn year. This year I got them, but they, they all got corn earwormed out pretty hard. And so I basically got 50% of the yield I would have gotten because I'm cutting that top off. Yeah. Um, tomatoes last year were prolific. This year, not terrible, but also far slower um, than they were last year. I think mostly just because of the weird SoCal weather we've had. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, it's interesting. It, but, but when did the, the the CSA, the local meat sourcing, maybe I'm assuming you also got, got eggs locally back then as well? Mm-hmm. When did that start? Like, was that something you were doing from a like a young adult age or was there, was it those books that you read that kind of made you realize that was the way to go? So my parents, like growing up, my mom had like a little garden with, you know, some tomato plants and some herbs and things like that, but it was just for fun. And then when I got married and my husband bought our first house, we were just eating a normal American diet, you know, going to the grocery store or whatever. And then I read those two books and it was really those two books that really were a mindset shift. And I was already cooking a ton of stuff from scratch. So I guess it wasn't technically necessarily a standard American diet because yeah. I would cook almost everything at home from scratch. But um, those books were what were kind of the impetus to switch my mind from thinking um, just going to the grocery store to see who can, who's around me that I can source this food from locally. Yeah. It's it, something you mentioned. I think it's the important mindset shift when you do go with a CSA or a farmer's market model is you just take what is there and build the meal plan afterwards. And I was wondering if you could like, I don't know, contrast how it used to be when you were going out meal planning, sort of acquiring the the produce that you needed versus let's say a recent CSA or maybe just haul out of the garden. Cause like right now you've got all the tomatoes, right? So like I'm assuming that that then means you're going to have to come up with some tomato focused recipes pretty soon here. Obviously we're getting into canning later in the week too. So that's probably a big solution. Um, so before I probably would have gone to like Pinterest or Google and just like Google and found recipes. And I'm like, Oh, these recipes look good. And so then I'm going to print those recipes and then I'm going to make a menu or a grocery list and go grocery shopping versus Right now, I have a pile of plums on my counter and have a ton of green beans, a ton of zucchini, and a ton of tomatoes. That's just what I have a lot of right now. So instead of um, just randomly searching recipes, I can just go into Pinterest and put in zucchini recipes or zucchini savory recipes. You know, there's only so much zucchini bread we can eat or tomato recipes. And then, and then I am going to preserve a lot of the stuff that I have for later use, like canning and. That's yeah. my project this afternoon, actually, is a big canning project. A big but canning sesh. I'm assuming yes. we'll see it on the channel pretty soon oh, yeah. if, you're, if you're filming yep. it. Yeah. Okay. Well, mm-hmm. that's, I mean, that's sort of how I'm certainly not as far along the road as you are from the cooking perspective, but I mm-hmm. have started to make that shift. I would say most recently in the last like year or two of just taking what comes, building things around it. I don't have as much of a source on meats, which I definitely should if I'm just thinking out loud. It's it's not an area where I, that, that'd be scarce, so I should probably just work on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, even, even this weekend, uh, in preparation for the hurricane that was supposed to come through, <laughs> I, I harvested early a bunch of tomatoes and I was like, okay, well, this is a, this is a clear saucing day because I don't have anything else. But then I just uh, lightened up part of the sauce, put some cream in it, put some herbs in it. And I made myself a version of a bisque, I suppose. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's just little, little things like that, that I'm learning. 
I think when you think of homesteading, you think of these beautiful pantries or root cellars that are filled to the brim with jars of everything under the sun. I know that's what I personally think about. To be honest, I'll I even fantasize about it a little bit of, of a future root cellar that I might have. Dare I say, this is one of the things that perhaps people are very attracted to your content for, Becky, is the way that you showcase the full process of, of preserving a lot of the stuff that you're growing in the garden, yeah? Yeah, I think so. I think it's fun to see the going from seed to garden to harvest into a meal slash putting it on the pantry shelf for later use. You said a hundred pounds of yes. some of those you got. <laughs> At least. <laughs> so when when we're talking canning for you, is that I mean, maybe if, if someone doesn't know the basics, mm -hmm. are we talking, you know, classic canning, like a water bath canning sort of method? And then you're putting those up for the winter, basically, right? Yeah. So um I started out when I started canning was water bath canning and it was tomatoes and applesauce. Those were like the two things. And then nice. jam. And then it's kind of evolved from there to now where I try to have a couple convenient type things on the pantry shelf too. So things like pizza sauce and ketchup and condiments, I guess. So just trying to replace what I would buy at the grocery store with my homemade or locally sourced if possible. And then last year I did start pressure canning too, which is where you can can low, acid low acidic foods like broth and beans and things like that. So that's been kind of cool being able to have my own homemade chicken broth on the pantry shelf. And then also I was able to grow a year's worth of black beans. And so instead of just keeping them dry, which I don't tend to, you know, cook with as often because they are a little bit more prep work and you kind of have to think advance um, because I've learned to pressure can them. I can put them in a jar and they're just like if I was to go to the store and buy a can of black beans. Oh, nice. Yeah. You know, that's to me definitely a more elite level of canning. How, how many years have you been actively canning? I have been canning for seven years. So I started okay. canning back when my husband and I first got married when we lived in our suburban lot. And it took me six years before I delved into the world of pressure canning. Mm -hmm. And when it comes down to it, pressure canning sounds super intimidating because you have to follow the rules exactly. I mean, yeah. canning in general, you need to follow the rules exactly. It's not something you want to mess around with the science of it because, you know, there's tried and true ways and it's very safe as long as you follow the rules. And when it comes down to pressure canning versus water bath canning, pressure canning is actually a lot easier to do. Mm. It's just getting over that intimidation factor, I guess. It took me a long time before I got over it. But once I did, I'm like, oh, this is actually a lot easier than... Yeah. And it's mostly because the prep work of when you're pressure canning beans, there's a lot less work that goes into that versus all the tomatoes. I've got to peel them and sauce them and cook them down and jams. You've got to cook them down. And there's just a lot more that goes into the actual making of the product before sure. you put it into the jar. Yeah. It's like cooking a whole recipe and then going exactly. through the canning. Pro I would say to me- That's exactly right. What what you mentioned is, is I believe, the- the intimidation factor. It's you hear these stories about canning gone wrong, and then you hear water bath, you hear pressure, and you're like, I don't even know what those mean, yeah. let alone the science of canning. Because it is it is a true science, right? You mentioned yeah. low acidity foods. And if someone doesn't understand what you might mean by that, I mean, you, you're putting cooked or uncooked food in a jar and leaving it at room temperature. There's obviously some serious considerations when you yes. do something like that. With no oxygen, and that's where it you can – exactly. So you need to know the science behind it. Yeah. Where did you go for early learnings in that? I, I still find it so interesting that before you were gardening, you were canning, which I think most people would do the reverse, I would imagine. But maybe it just stems from your love of cooking. I think it – yeah, it stemmed from my love of cooking, and I was going down, you know, like a health – rabbit hole and, you know, buying tomato sauce in a tin can. And if you jar it, then it's in a glass jar. And I couldn't afford to go buy mm. tomatoes in a glass jar because they're three times the price, you know, at the grocery store. And that's kind of to where it came from. And I had the passion to want to grow stuff, but I didn't have the space or the ability to do that. And so I'm kind of glad that I did it in that order because when you're growing a ton of stuff and if I didn't know how to can and I had 150 pounds of tomatoes on my counter, that would be very stressful. And so it kind of worked out that 
it happened in this order that it was learning to cook and then preserve food and then grow it because they're all totally different skill sets. And to try to learn them all at one time would be extremely overwhelming. And so that's just the natural progression at work in my life, just because I didn't have an area to have a garden. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. I, I, almost every guest we have on the show, it inevitably comes to like, what got you to start gardening? And everyone has a different flavor of maybe a dozen different angles, right? So like, in, in your case, it's cooking into gardening. In my case, it was like more of the scientific angle of growing other someone else might just be, you know, I, I had an injury, I needed to get active again, right? There's just like so many mm-hmm. different paths. When we get back to canning, though, like, you mentioned you make ketchup yourself, your, your own pizza sauce, some of these like, grocery staples that almost all of us probably don't think twice about hitting up the grocery store to to go ahead and buy. How many of those would you say are just dramatically better when you create them yourself? And how many of those are just like swaps that because you love to can and cook, you just end up doing them? Like is ketchup just way better if you make it yourself? No. (laughs) Actually, ketchup is one of the things that is better store-bought. So um, there are just like a crushed tomato. I love a home can crushed tomato. Um, Jam is a hundred times better. Mm. I mean, if there's one thing that go and find a low sugar recipe and get fruit that's in season because you want to be able to taste that really fresh fruit. And so jam probably would be number one broth. It's basically Uh, pennies on the dollar. Um, You can make some delicious broth. And I mean, you could even make broth and freeze it too. You don't have to can it if you mm. you don't know how to do that. But um, there are some things that I've done that I'm like, well, I will never do that again. It wasn't worth my time. And probably, let's let's hear a couple of those. (laughs) I'm interested in those. Probably ketchup is one of them. Um, I don't, I can more just single ingredient items because I like to be able to do what I want with them after. Um, I've done some like pickle type things and I'm like, I don't eat that. Oh, hot sauce. I can all of our own hot sauce, Mm -hmm. make all of our own hot sauce and we eat I eat a lot of hot sauce. <laughs> so I feel that's like probably... that's one that for sure makes sense to do yourself because you you have yeah. way more access to different pepper varieties if you grow them yourself. And then yeah. hot sauce, I don't know, hot sauce has a bit of a mythology around it, right? Like everyone has their own version that their grandfather or grandmother made and just so many different ways to do it. I was thinking if I was going to get into canning some of those staples, let's say like a ketchup, I would probably only do it if I was going to somehow enhance that ketchup with another flavor profile or something like truffled ketchup or yeah, I don't know, something like that, that that I couldn't get at a store, right? You can do some really cool fruit ketchups because ketchup traditionally is made with all different types of fruit. It's just in America, we eat tomato ketchup and I have made some really cool um, like I made a rhubarb barbecue sauce. And so it's kind of like a mixture between a ketchup and a barbecue sauce. And um, that's really good. Um, You can make some really cool like chutneys, like fig, onion, caramelized onion, balsamic chutney on a burger is really really good. That'd be really good. (laughs) Um, That's one of our favorites on burgers. Um, So so if you can make ketchup with different fruits, Mm -hmm. what makes a ketchup a ketchup if – I always thought tomato was sort of a core essential of it, but it sounds like it's not. Like, what is the quality that makes ketchup ketchup? Ketchup is like a fruit that's cooked down in vinegar and sugar to preserve it over the winter. So okay. ketchup is like a really old um, – have you ever watched like James, James Townsend on YouTube? Yeah. He's like yeah. – yeah. So he makes yeah. like some really like traditional ketchups and it's really just like you take fruit or um, – even like mushrooms and you just cook it down in a vinegar, sugar, spiced Mm. thing. And it's a condiment that's supposed to, you know, like last for over winter basically. Yeah. I did not know that. That's fascinating. What would you say is like the weirdest thing that you've canned that actually was good? Maybe canned potatoes is kind of weird. Yeah. Um, I've seen those before. I've I've always been like, why? You know, like uh, I feel like you could just store them in the root cellar or something. Well, it depends on some people don't have like, um, you know, like a cold enough spot to, yeah. or the humidity is not right, you know? That's actually my um, house, unfortunately. They always yeah. sprout on me. <laughs> they kind of take a lot of work and the convenience is nice because you can open the jar and they're basically almost cooked. So you can put them on a cookie sheet, put some olive oil, salt and pepper on them, and you can get them really, really crispy in the oven really quickly because they're already cooked and you're just... um 
it's kind of like, you know, how we, when you're cooking like a fried potato in a cast iron, it's better to use like a baked potato to do that because they're already right. cooked and you're going to get a good fry on it. It's basically like that. I learned like that, that the hard way. It took <laughs> yeah. forever because w- I'm obsessed. I just really like diner food. Um, yeah. <laughs> like I had, I went to a local diner today and just had like bacon, eggs and potatoes and some coffee, you know, like a classic yeah. meal. And so I, I get obsessed with just like diner style hash browns because that's it's just yeah. to me so good. And I never realized how to make them until, I don't know, a year or two ago. And you're totally right. Like the pre-cooked potato is yeah. pretty essential to a lot of these crispier potato recipes. I just had no clue that's how it worked. So that's basically why a canned potato, it seems really weird, but it is convenient when you want to go fry it quickly because mm-hmm. it's already been cooked once. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay, so if someone wants to get started with canning, water bath canning, I would assume, would be the way you'd go, right? Yeah, I think so. That's it. That's like the. It seems like the natural progression. Yeah, it just feels so intimidating to buy like that big old pressure canner yeah. going in completely cold, like never having done it before. You know, but maybe I will. I don't know. Something the cool it. thing about a pressure canner is you can water bath can in a pressure canner. So if you're already going to buy, you know, a big stock pot to water bath can in, you could just spend a few extra dollars and get yourself a pressure canner and water bath can in it until you're comfortable opening the manual to actually pressure can in it. <laughs> That's the only reason why I would say maybe buy a pressure canner okay, first that makes sense. Be- because is you can it- water bath can in it. Is there a is there a particular one that you really love? Because I'm I'm actually getting into this like in the next two, three weeks here, because it's kind of end of the season, you know? The if, if you want a handheld pressure canning canner, get the Presto Electric Countertop Canner. It's like an instant pot, but it's a approved pressure canner. And you literally push the button and there's no thinking. It does the whole thing for you. Okay. And that, I think, is game changing when it comes to pressure canning because yeah. you put in, you know, like your elevation and then you literally just put the dial, put the, um, how many minutes and it, you, there's no sitting and watching a gauge yeah. or anything like that. So it's the Presto digital pressure canner. Okay. Okay. I'm going to look that up. Yeah. I mean, even the fact that you said you put in your elevation, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just not something you think about, right? When you're cooking, yeah. I guess maybe if you're baking, I think, to me, one of the things that seems to really do well, people seem to love about your content are the meals that you'll make from scratch. And oftentimes, like a big list of of meals that are great for the freezer, which I historically have not really done. I, I typically just will cook and then just eat and then cook. It's endless cycle, <laughs> cooking, <laughs> cooking and eating. Um, and so can we start with just a bit of your 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 overall process, like your philosophy of cooking from from the garden? I just enjoy kind of pushing my cooking abilities and figuring out what I can cook from scratch. And instead of buying at the grocery store, does that mean I always cook it from scratch? No, but there's something kind of empowering to know that, oh, if I want to cook that from scratch, I know how to do it. And that just came from, honestly, when I was younger and I was bored, I would pull out some recipe books and start cooking. And then it just kind of spiraled into trying to figure out, oh, what can I cook from scratch? And so it's just kind of fun to, and it tastes good. I like to eat because it tastes good. (laughs) And so a lot of times when you make stuff at home, not every time, but a lot of things homemade are better than store-bought. And so that's kind of where it just came from, the love of eating good food. Yeah. I think um, I cooked, I'm trying to think like what, what was my first significant thing I ever cooked? I think I was maybe 13 or 14 and I cooked ravioli from scratch um, and realized- it took me so long. It took me like four yeah. hours maybe. <laughs> yeah. uh, and now thinking about it, because I've been starting to do some homemade pastas from the garden because I'm using, sometimes I could even go full from the garden because we grew our own wheat. Yeah, uh, that's But then cool. obviously, you know, chickens, chickens with the eggs, but started to do some sort of like fettuccine style pastas with that KitchenAid um, like press yeah. thing, which is fantastic. Uh, and then realized like, wow, it was really hard when I was 14. It's actually not that di- difficult to make fresh pasta. No. Um, but I guess like anything, right? You try it, it's intimidating, and then it's not the second time, a little bit less the third time. Um, but y- y- you make a lot of meals in bulk, right? Like you do mm-hmm. a lot of sort of bulk prep and 
Maybe yeah. it's like a week's worth of food or something like that. Yeah. So that started really because I was working as a dental hygienist full time. And then I started my YouTube channel, which is a full time job. And oh, I, so sure. I had two jobs and we, I had just been laid off because of the pandemic for two and a half months. And we did not have the resources to just go get takeout when I was done with my day job and then coming home. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of just started the learning how to bulk prep meals to put into my freezer so that I can have really yummy scratch made meals anytime we want without the pressure of having to cook and then have to clean the kitchen and all of that. Yeah. And a lot of big bulk batch cooking, they were, you know, opening a jar of, which there's nothing wrong with this, but it's just not the way I cook, opening a jar of salad dressing, pouring it over chicken and calling that a marinade. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. my that's just not my style. And so I just took those principles that I saw other people doing and I kind of just adapted them to my style of cooking. And so just, you know, getting a bunch of different types of cut of meat and making a bunch of marinades at one time, getting the kitchen dirty one time. And then I have all this stuff prepped and ready to go in my freezer so I can just pull it out. And now that I'm only working one job, but like today I'm going to be doing a huge <laughs> canning yeah. day. I'm going to pull out some meat that I have marinated in the freezer and then I'll throw it on the grill at night. I'll cut up some tomatoes, some cucumbers, and we'll have a salad with dinner and that's dinner. So it's not going to take me any time really to make dinner because I don't need to pull out the raw chicken and get yeah. the marinade made and all that stuff. That's actually really interesting because in my head, when I think, and I've tried this before, sort of bulk prepping, I typically hadn't frozen it. I'd mostly toss it in the fridge, but then the issue becomes like, then you're sort of committing to eating it and on, on sort of a you know, spoilage schedule, which sometimes yes. isn't, isn't the best. It's, it feels like, it almost feels like an obligation sometimes. So going yeah. to the freezer obviously makes sense because then it, it really at will, but it's, it still sounds like you're, you're sort of prepping the base ingredients and you still are whipping something up at the time of, of cooking, but you just removed most of the annoying parts of doing that, you know, Monday through Sunday over and over and over again, multiple times a day, right? Yeah. So if in my big bulk freezer cooking videos, I have kind of different style meals that I have. So I have meals that have everything in it. So if all I want to do is, you know, it's got my protein, my starch and my meat, I can throw that in the oven and that's all in one and done. And then yeah. if I want to do a salad or something, I can, but I don't feel like I need to because, you know, it might be a stuffed pepper. So you've got your rice okay. and your yeah. sausage and your pepper. Um, or it might be something like a bunch of meat that's marinated. So then yes, I would probably make you know, some rice or veggie side or whatever. So I do kind of have different, if that makes sense, like depending on my mood or what I need, mm -hmm. um, different things prepped in the freezer for me. Yeah. Yeah. You'll have like a full on prep or just like a base ingredient sort of prep. Yeah. When, when you, when you bring those back up to temp and, and cook them or reheat them, I suppose, it sounds like you're mm -hmm. going with the oven because I feel like, at least in my head, when I've tried this in the past, and maybe maybe people listening could relate, I, I don't know. I feel like one of the downsides of potentially going with the bulk prep model is that mm -hmm. the food doesn't – I don't know how to describe this. It's almost like an emotion that I feel when, when, uh, when I do this where I'm like, yeah, I made that like five days ago though. Like, do I really want it? Like that sort of thing will come back to me. And so what what do you do to – keep yourself, um, I don't know, excited to eat what you've prepped? Um, I think having different options in the freezer is good that you're not, you know, you don't have 10 lasagnas and then the only thing you have to pull out is like a lasagna because yeah. that would get boring. <laughs> that's I used to do it. So that's probably my problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing that I freeze a lot of is like pizza dough. And so you can pull that out oh. and you can turn that into a bunch of different things. You can make you know, pizza pockets, calzones, pizza. Um, you can turn it into something different. Yeah. Marinated meats is a good example of that. You So usually when I do that, I will make, um, say, I did a basil peach because peaches and basil were in season. So the last big cooking day I did was a basil, basil peach marinade. And I did um, a pork and a chicken. And so, you know, I 
prepped one marinade and then I put it in two different types of meat so that when I pull it out, it's going to be different. Yeah. It's not going to taste the same. And then depending on what sides I put with it are, you know, going to be different. So yesterday I was processing 150 years of corn and I made a corn salsa with some of the corn that I was processing. I pulled out um, the basil chicken. I threw that on the grill. We had some tortillas. We had I had some pico de gallo I'd, I had made mm -hmm. and some hot sauce that I had made and sour cream. And that was dinner. But next time I pull out the pork, I might make mashed potatoes and green beans or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to like, because I haven't gone as deep onto the cooking side, but I want to, I think for mm -hmm. me, a lot of it's like time in the day, I guess. And it sounds like you've come up with some really clever ways to kind of solve for that. Um, but the way you approach it is super, it's super unique. It's very flexible. So you have some sort of raw ingredients and base things. Maybe you'll go all the way and make a full thing. And then a lot of it seems to be like, what are you feeling that day with yeah. the, you know, with the set of ingredients that that's at hand. And in your case, which is awesome, that a lot of them are homegrown or home produced or at least locally sourced and sort of transformed in some way. Yeah, it's yeah, really cool. Goal. What what would Thanks. be like, what would be some, maybe, maybe pretend like I'm the one who needs the advice because I'm actually might be. Um, <laughs> What would be like a basic end of summer kind of thing? Like, let's say I've got, which I do, I have an absolute boatload of peppers right now. Um, I have a decent amount of tomatoes and I've got, let's see. Oh, actually, you know what? I have dramatically too many tomatillos, like <laughs> dramatically way too many. Um, walk me through how you would think about the transformation of those into like a prep or a scratch made, you know, sort of freezer meals for the week? Like what, where does your head go? Um, well, with the tomatillos, that's pretty easy. I would probably make, and some of the peppers, I would make salsa verde yeah. and I would either can that or you could make enchiladas and throw a couple, two pans of enchiladas in the freezer with your homemade salsa verde. I love making canned salsa verde because enchiladas are so easy to make just on, you know, a weekday and, mm -hmm. Um, you just, you know, replaced that is one thing that when we were talking about canning is absolutely delicious, homemade and canned, and mm -hmm. you can easily replace that from a store-bought version. Um, tomatoes, you could make a bunch of pasta sauce. And if you don't want to can it, you could, you know, make a bunch of pasta sauce, freeze it. You could make tomato soup and freeze it or can it, um, peppers. I would make hot sauce. I also like one thing that's really nice to make too is um, I'll take chicken and I'll slice it up really thinly. I'll put some sliced onion, some sliced peppers in a Ziploc bag with fajita seasoning and put that in the freezer and mm. then um, thaw that out and put it in a really hot, hot, hot cast iron skillet. And that would be an easy prep too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think... Um I don't know. There's something about it that always feels so intimidating to me, I guess, of like putting it all together. And it feels like, you know, that movie, The Matrix, like when yeah. <laughs> Neo can see the zeros yeah. and ones at the end of the movie, it feels like that's where you're at with it. And I'm still <laughs> I'm still in The Matrix like, what? This isn't real, you know. Uh, but no, it's it's really it's really cool to hear this. Obviously, on Becky's channel, you can see her go through the process. And I'm, I'm going to be hitting a few more of your playlists, I think, Becky, as, as the season goes on. <laughs> How do you garden for your family and grow food, so much food, really, that you don't need to source anything else, uh, at least vegetables? I know that's not a, entirely accurate, Becky, because you mentioned that you will sometimes have a crop failure or you'll, you'll sometimes decide to source you know, other produce locally. But I mean, if you just talk me through the setup of your garden, it seems like a lot of it, maybe the lion's share is coming from your own land these days, right? Yeah. So I could eat, we could eat right now from probably from June until November, 100% produce from the garden if I wanted to. But, you know, I choose not to do that for a couple of reasons. Well, the biggest reason is like my corn that I have out there. I've always struggled to grow corn. I've tried four years in a row. I'll try again next year, but um, I don't know if my corn's going to produce anything. So I did go to my local farmer because corn's in season and I bought 150 ears of corn yesterday. And so I preserved that up because I want to have, I like the taste of home preserved corn in the freezer. Mm-hmm. 
And so I didn't want to, you know, waste that opportunity because I am going to die on a principle that I'm not going to eat anything that I don't grow. Or um, like last year, my tomatillos didn't do hardly anything and we like salsa verde. So I went and bought a bunch of tomatillos from a local farmer to preserve that up. This year, my tomatillos are doing fine, so I'm not going to need to do that. And so, but our generally our eating, unless I'm buying a big bulk thing to preserve up for the year, we generally are eating 100% produce from our garden. Yeah. And just really quickly on, on the corn, what what's happening to yours that's causing it to fail, do you think? Well, the first two years I planted my corn in an in-ground garden that I didn't it wasn't on my irrigation system, so I I chalk that up 100% to just me not watering it enough. Sure. Yeah. And then this year, I'm not sure if I See, I don't know that much about it. I need to do more research, but my corn tasseled, but there were no cobs on the stalks. Oh, and then okay. I noticed a week ago that there are now corn swarming on my stocks. And I, to me, that doesn't seem right, but <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I'm just that's, letting that's it grow. to me as well. Like it's a, it's a missync of the tasseling and the silky yeah. process where it's too offset. Um, yeah. S- such that the tassels, when they're sprinkling the pollen down, they're landing on nothing, right? That's exactly what, yeah. Yeah. That's happened to me before too. I actually chatted. The only person I've talked to this year that's actually had a good corn year was Jacques, um, oh. which, which annoys me because he's not that far from me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's not like I can't blame it on the climate or whatever. I, yeah. I think I, but what he said he did, and I feel like this year for a lot of people, I'm actually curious what you think because my tomatoes were slow. We had a very unseasonably cloudy Feb to June-ish in San Diego. We mm-hmm. had more rain in the first two months of the year than we had all of last year. And mm-hmm. then of course, we just had a tropical storm in August. And so I would say it's the weirdest weather year. And to me, if I'm just benchmarking off of the way I planted it last year, and I do the same thing into the weirdest weather year in San Diego, I I think I've had, obviously stuff's not going to match up. And so perhaps it's like a a stress issue that's causing the missynced timing. I I think I read an article about it a long time ago, because I think I had that problem a little bit last year. And it's super frustrating because you're like, okay, like, where are you? You know, I know they can be offset by about a week and that's like normal-ish, but more than that, I think starts to be a little, a little bizarre. Yeah. I, I don't know. We, we, where we live, we are super dry. I mean, the Pacific Northwest is known to be wet, but we, we've had like two days of rain in the last four months, but because we get all of our rain in the fall and winter. And so I don't, but my corn is on irrigation, so it looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I was really excited about it. I just don't know if, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe it'll get a late, you'll get a late set on it somehow. There's still some pollen left in the tassels. Yeah. (laughs) We'll have to see. Well, okay. So, so what about the layout of the garden? Like, are you mostly in ground? Are you in raised beds? Like what's your setup like? I am a hundred percent in raised beds right now. Last, the, my, this is my first year at this garden. The previous three years I had played around with raised beds and, some in-ground gardening and different styles. I did, you know, like a no-till area. I did some roost out and I've always just had the best success with in uh, raised beds because I can control the environment a little bit better. I think it takes a long time, you know, to build that soil and um, with some of the in-ground stuff and I don't have a lot of time. And so weed management is a lot easier for me in a raised bed. So I just decided to just do raised beds for the, yeah. the fact that I've had the best success and just the amount of time I have to actually maintain the garden on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, I would I would totally agree with you. I, I think the first thing I set up on my new, now somewhat old, I guess, um, property was, was a raised bed garden in the front yard. Actually, that's not true. I, I set up a grow bag garden in the backyard, but still it's a, it's a container. Yeah. You get to use, use soil you're buying in so you know it's at least not atrocious, right? It might not be the highest quality, but it's not, you know, hard pan clay like I had in my backyard. And then I did venture into in ground in the backyard, which I've left, I think to your point, like I've left it a bit more wild, a bit, a bit less like purposefully cultivated. I'm not as concerned if there are a little bit of weeds here and there. Mm -hmm. Um, and and that's been honestly kind of freeing, but, um, in, in the raised beds, it's, it's very, prim and proper. It's very, you know, I know what I'm planting. I know which bed everything is in type of thing. And that's been super helpful. And I would say for certainly for someone beginning, that's where I would recommend. Because to me, if you're beginning, I just want you to not fail. 
Um, yeah. And, and so to send you send you on down like tilling out a you know clay backyard, I feel like is not the right recipe. Yeah, I agree. What are the plans? As I'm assuming, at least that this is not this is the fine is this the final stop as far as land, or do you think you'll you'll make another size upgrade at some point in the future? I don't know. We yeah. um, are super happy where we are right now. We we don't have any plans, but you know, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> yeah, a- acres homes. You know, many ac- twenty acres homestead in the future yeah. could be really cool. Well, well, what are the plans on the space right now? Do you, do you want to mess around with in ground as as the years go on, or is the garden at a size that you're comfortable with, and you're just going to keep sort of planting into the same area? I think the kind of like the vegetable garden is big enough for me just to keep the way it is. The next big goals we have for the property are to plant a pretty big orchard. I want to plant a vineyard. I want to kind of get more into some of those like perennial type things. And so my like annual vegetable garden for now, I think is about the size that I want to keep it um, because I can grow a significant amount of food in the space that I have right now. Um, so I think the next thing is getting more into the, the perennial, um, fruit and stuff like that. Yeah. Do you have any sort of fruit tree, orchard, vineyard stuff in the ground? Yeah. The previous owner of this house planted about eight fruit trees and they are actually very productive. That's, I've got a big bowl of plums over there that I'm going to deal with this afternoon too. Um, but they, um, they're kind of all cl- like planted super close together and um, they haven't really been maintained that well and things. So they are productive, but yeah. um, we're probably, we'll probably just leave them the way they are and then kind of go into a whole new section on the property with fruit trees and blueberry plants. And oh yeah, the, the previous owner had about five blueberry plants too. So oh, I want to plant nice. a bunch of those. Nice. Yeah. 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 I, I, um, let's see when I got here, there was a lemon a grapefruit tree that was oh, actually cool. two in one hole, but it was so uh, poorly maintained that, and it was at a weird size and a weird position. I ended up removing it and crying a little bit because it, do, it yeah. didn't technically produce. Uh, there's a loquat tree. That one's still on the property. I believe there was an apricot, sorry, a plum in the backyard that a gopher ate the roots of and just oh. sort of pulled the whole thing <laughs> under. Which oh, is gosh. Over. But I did, I did have um, a royal apricot tree in the backyard, which looked so sad to the point where I did think it was, it was dead. Um, but then mm-hmm. I gave it like a very, very deep soak, like a multi-hour drip soak once, uh, and decided to do some like really hardcore pruning cuts. Said, oh, you know, if it comes back in spring, then that's fine, and it did. And and now, you know, that's been a fantastic fruit tree. But I did put in, I think on the maybe six months after I moved in, I put in this fifteen row or fifteen plant row citrus. Just under the idea that hey, I know I I know I love citrus. I can grow in San Diego really well, and the mm-hmm. sooner you get an orchard in the ground, the better. But also, if you make mistakes getting it in, then you can't really un- undo them. Yeah. So it's it's yes. a it's a devilish uh, conundrum to like choose if you're going to do it early or if you're going to wait a little bit to establish. But either way, it's it's such a bounty of of produce. Yeah. That's why we didn't do it the first year, you know, but they say best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago or today. Yeah. And we were like, well, we can wait one year because I want to make sure that I put the fruit trees where I actually want them for 20 That's, years, you yeah. know, if we're going to be here. So we, I, th- I think next year, that's one of our big goals. This year That'll was getting cool in like the, the garden. Yeah. yeah. And imagine what it'll open up for you in, I guess, three, three more years after that, yeah. right? I mean, you're going you're to have to have like a canning separate building that you build. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a whole root cellar and an extra freezer and all sorts of stuff like that. Is this something that you did, Becky, before hosting parties? Like, did you do this before at, at the suburban house that you were in? Is it something that you were always into or did it kind of blossom with the addition of space and, and growing? Yeah. So I grew up, my mom was always big into hosting. We always had big parties and things like that. And so when my husband and I first got married and we lived in our suburban lot, we had parties all the time. And it's just kind of grown and evolved as I've had a homestead and growing food. But it definitely is something that I have been doing well before I had a garden or was trying to buy local food or anything like that. Got it. Yeah. So 
what to you makes a good, what is hosting to you? Maybe I'll just go that basic. Like, what does that mean to you to, to host someone, to host people at your house? Like, what is a good host supposed to do? I think a good host is just supposed to make people feel comfortable in your yeah. home and welcome. Yeah. I don't think it has to be this elaborate or intimidating thing to invite people to our homes. It just needs to, you know, be a time to have fun and just enjoy each other's company. I think sometimes when you think of like hosting a party, it can feel really intimidating, but it it's just a matter of just hanging out and enjoying each other's company. Yeah, I think I, I'm, I wonder what you, your thoughts are on this. I, I was on Twitter. I guess it's now called X, but oh. <laughs> whatever. Uh, <laughs> the new owner renamed it. But either way, I'm still going to call it Twitter. Um, and someone had mentioned that they are big hosters. Mm-hmm. And it's like part of their sort of family identity, part of their life. And they remarked that almost no one like hosts them back. A- mm. And I think it wasn't like a complaint or anything. It was just an observation that the art of hosting seems to be uh, being lost. And I'm wondering if you, you feel the same or like, what do you think is the reason for that? I don't know. I never really thought about that. Um, I usually when we host, we have stuff at our house. Um, but I've never really thought of, I've never really thought about that before. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I just remember like, I'm 36 now, actually. Um, I just just had to think about that. Um, But I remember as a kid, I do recall going over to people's homes more than I do today. But obviously, like, my life situation is different. I don't have, you know, I'm not living with my mom and dad anymore and all that. And I don't know. It just seems like it's unfortunately going out of style a little bit. And so maybe you could just kind of walk us through some of the parties or get-togethers that you, you like to have. So I like to have people over just because it's sometimes more relaxing to me to have people in my home versus always going out. Don't get me wrong. I enjoy going out with my friends and, you know, having a good, you know, time sitting at a restaurant and not having to worry about cooking or cleaning. But there's something nice and and kind of intimate about having people into our home. And I think that sometimes when we think of hosting, sometimes we might think that we have to like do everything. A lot of times, and this has been something that's been super fun, is when Josh and I will have parties, we will make it a themed event where the theme might be, we've done this like every Friendsgiving, we do a themed Friendsgiving and nobody wants turkey three times at Thanksgiving. That's kind of our idea. So we'll do, um, we've done uh, India And that's the theme. And then everybody is responsible for bringing one Indian dish. Mm. And I usually, because I'm usually the one that's hosting it, I will do the main. So whatever like the protein is. And then I will ask people, what side do you want to do? Do you want to do a bread? Um, And I usually ask them and I try to coordinate with my friends just so that not everybody's bringing a dessert. And then people can make a new recipe or they can go buy something if they want to not have to make it. But it kind of alleviate some of the stress of me having to, you know, do everything, you know, Mm -hmm. making sure the house is clean and cooking all the food. I just make sure the house clean and then do the main dish and then everyone else brings stuff. And it kind of makes people feel involved and can talk about what they brought and why they brought it. And Mm -hmm. that's been super fun. We do, we do those a lot where we'll do like a theme, like Julia Child's, like everyone has to bring a recipe from Julia Child's cookbook or something like that. Interesting. Yeah. I, I, um, trying to think what the last what's the last like themed get together I had I think I had this past Christmas season I did a cookie baking sesh like oh yeah that's fun decoration (laughs) sesh yeah um and had some friends and family over it's a couple people from the epic gardening team and I think your point is 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 a great one like even just a small thing that someone can bring even if it's just like the little silver balls that you like put yeah. on the cookies or whatever, right? They, they feel like they're part of it. Um, and it just makes for a more interactive, interactive time. If you, if you're doing a party, are you just sort of doing like a, a more extreme version of the meal planning and prep that we've talked about? Like, like looking at the garden, Hey, what do I have? Maybe I'll whip up a jam or a quick dessert from the garden type of thing. Yeah, I have a lot of videos on dinner parties and like how I go about thinking about them. I've done them where I 
didn't let myself buy one thing for it. And so I have to go to my oh. freezers and my garden and my um, pantry and make up. And I've made really elaborate dinner party meals with just things that I have on hand. Um, so sometimes I think too, when we think of like hosting people, we think it has to be like very expensive and extravagant Mm -hmm. and you can do it for very affordably with things that you already have on hand. And it just depends on like what the party is about, like why, uh, how I go about thinking about planning for it. Um, obviously like my mom and I, we do like Thanksgiving together. And so that's kind of more of traditional menu. So, you know, we're probably going to go to the store and like get the things we need if we don't have them for that menu. Um, so it really just depends on what the party is about. We kind of, I kind of think of parties as either like, um, a holiday where you've got your traditional menu that you're thinking, or you're celebrating a person. So then you might ask that person, what do they want? So a lot of the thinking doesn't have to be done by you. You can just ask them, you know, if you're doing a, a graduation or a birthday or something like that, and you're celebrating a particular person. Yeah. They can be the ones to do the thinking of the menu planning or um, if it's a themed event that helps too. Like I was talking about like Julia Childs or, um, you know, picking a country cuisine and then basing your whole party based off that theme. If if you're doing a dinner party, um, whether it's, whether it's themed or not, is there like a size that makes sense to you of, of people to attend? Um, I think probably whatever you're, comfortable with and wherever, wherever you have your party where you can fit, you think you can fit that many people comfortably. Um, we tend to invite a lot of people and we just kind of will, you know, like I've set up, um, folding tables in my living room because that's the only place I can get a table big enough for everybody. And, and I think it's more thinking too, like who's going to be like comfortable together and like maybe those type of dynamics versus like, what is the proper number of people at a particular party. Yeah, I guess, especially if you have sort of an eclectic group of friends, um, it, it, I guess you do kind of have to think about which which parties would mesh well or uh, I don't know if there's some dramas between. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> you know, hopefully, yeah. hopefully not, but I'm sure, you know, that's that's people, right? I'm sure that happens yeah. sometimes. Um, you, have, you have something coming out about this pretty soon, don't you? Yeah, so my mom and I developed a e-course on hosting and how to do it stress-free and how to plan from like the conception of the idea of the party all the way until the day of the party and what to do on the day of the party. One thing that my mom and I, um, we have, I have a ton of videos on YouTube about my mom and I doing parties and things like that, but how to break up the party planning and the cooking, um, where you don't have to do it all on one day. You don't have to do all the cleaning and cooking and preparing and all of that on one day. And it really like breaks it out into really easy digestible pieces on how to get from idea to party with very, very little stress. Okay. Well, when it it comes out, I'm going to be purchasing (laughs) for sure, Becky. (laughs) Is this like, this is an area that, you know, it's just my brain that seems to struggle with, but I do, I do recognize the value of it, right? Because when you, when you have one, even if it doesn't go perfectly to plan, which which mine really sort of don't, um, I'm so glad that I did it much more so than if I had just, I don't know, went out and, you know, watched a movie on, by myself or, you know, just stayed yeah. in for the night, not not been around people, which is tempting to do as a gardener who runs a business from your home, much like, I mean, we're yeah. both kind of the same same vibe there. The, the temptation sometimes is to kind of just hole up and live that life. Uh, instead of invite people into it. It's this fantastic um, suggestion. And we're getting into party season, I guess, everyone, right? Yes, got we are. Thanksgiving, <laughs> you got the holidays, you got Halloween. So a lot of different parties coming up. It's been really cool having you on the show, Becky. Um, I'm going to be doing a bit of binging, I-, I will confess. A lot of people on our team are are big fans of, of your channel. So I encourage everyone oh, to watch. Awesome. But uh, is there anywhere else that, that people can find you or get in contact? Um, Instagram is where I probably do the most like real time updates. And so if you kind of want real time updates, Instagram, I am on TikTok, but I am not super active over there. So YouTube is probably like the, the biggest place to find me. And then, um, I keep all my recipes on my website, which is scratchpantry.com. And those are totally free for anybody who wants to try a recipe. Okay, cool. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Becky. It's been really fun. Yeah, thank you for having me.